The cost of installing electrics for your house extension project is going to be several thousand pounds. Designing the system and the sizing, this is the skillful bit and laying the cables is easy but requires a lot of labour. And all three of these tasks I think you can do yourself without any fancy engineering or mathematics or practical skills actually, without any risk of injury or shock and with the minimum of tools. So keep watching and save yourself several thousand pounds. Avoid that stressful wait to get your electrician's time slot for your extension build. Now let's start with designing the circuits and at this point all I care about where I want to put my plug sockets, what electrical appliances I want and the light points. Just these three things, I won't distract myself with switches, extract fans, smoke detectors, appliance switches, nor consumer units, breakers and loadings, just yet. If you're lucky, your architect might have already drawn a plan for you, you might have drawn it yourself, but they won't have thought about the circuits from a wiring point of view, so I won't pay too much attention to their drawings other than to use them as a starting point and to help me with the overall picture. Using the plan of my proposed extension, I'll first start by drawing on where I want my radiators, as these will take precedence over my wall sockets in terms of wall real estate. If you're in doubt about where to put them, I'll try to locate my radiators below windows to eliminate downdrafts. I'll think about the volume of the room. I'll also think about the symmetry of the room, like here with these tall units. And don't worry about the radiator sizes at this point. Next up, I'll think about where I want my furniture and I'll do this by thinking about how I'll use the space and sketch on the basic shapes of things like tables and chairs, which will help me think about pendant lights over the dining table, where I might stand a floor lamp, where my television might be, speaker points, and even where I might want to plug in a vacuum cleaner. For bedrooms, I'd think about bed position, which in turn would set up bedside lamps and chargers. I'll use this symbol for wall plugs and I'll make all these sockets into double sockets. I'll use this symbol for pendant lights, this for wall lights, I'll use this for spotlights and I'll make a symbol ski at the side of the drawing so everyone can understand it. Now of course you'll need to have an idea of how you want the kitchen layout to be at this point. Usually start with sink positions and then uh, where I want to cook and that will give me the basic layout and then I'll draw a square box for each appliance. I'll write the name and wattage of each by looking at the manufacturer's literature. If I haven't yet chosen the make and model of my appliances, let's use this list as a guide for you, which will cover the majority of situations. Here I'm using an extract hood, dishwasher, a fridge freezer, microwave cooker and induction hob. You might have a washing machine, a waste disposal unit on the sink, maybe an inbuilt coffee machine, whatever else you can think of. Maybe you're replacing your boiler for the increased heating capacity for your extension and which in fact I am doing for this project. The top of my sockets need to be a minimum of 450 plus the depth of the socket, say 70 millimeters, so that's 520 in total. Where they sit above a kitchen worktop for using my kettle, for example, I'll make them 1200 millimeters above the floor. And once the worktop is in, they'll sit around 300 millimeters above the worktop, which will be high enough to allow molded plugs to sit comfortably. If I've got some fancy splashback or unusual tiles, I'll need to think about that, but I try to keep it simple in my designs to make coordination easier and design out potential mistakes. Now, if you're looking at a typical home extension under say 70 square meters, the information I'm gonna provide here will do it for you, but I'll always check with my certifying electrician before I proceed, just to be sure. If there's doubt in your mind or if you've got a bigger floor area, meaning long cable runs, then sure, you can manually calculate the cable sizing using some online helpers. And once I've laid out my sockets and appliances, it's time to position the switches. For the light switches, I'll use this symbol. These switches sit on the wall at waist height. To comply with building regulations, these need to be a maximum of 1200 millimeters above the finished floor. I also want all my light switches to line up 
and coincidentally that's what we set out in our worktop sockets at, so the whole thing is coordinated. With our layout complete, the only thing I need to know is the position of my consumer unit. Then it's time to plan the route of circuits which will run from the consumer unit. I'll group all the sockets and the appliances operating under say 1500 watts into one circuit and I'll make this a loop where the cable snakes in and out of each socket and then back to the consumer unit and I'll use 2.5mm twin and earth cable. So the appliances under 1500 here are the dishwasher, the microwave, the extract hood and the fridge freezer. And before I go any further I'll add the wattage up of each of these appliances and then I'll count the number of spare sockets. I'll include a kettle at maybe another 1500 watts and add an additional 100 watts for each spare socket. And if my total wattage exceeds this number, then I'll consider splitting the circuit into two. This loop is what we call a ring main, and I'm creating a single ring main for the sockets in this extension. Each socket on the ring will have cables coming into it, and then the same cable will come out to go to the next socket, and then back to the source. Now about those bigger wattage appliances, they need a thicker cable and I'll make a single circuit for each. I'll use a 10mm twin and earth cable. Now for sure I could use 6mm if I do the sums, but we're belt and braces here. These circuits where they don't return on a loop to the consumer unit are called radials and I'm using individual 10mm radials for both the induction hob and the cooker. I want the new gas boiler to be on its own circuit too, but due to the low wattage we can use 1.5mm cable here. If it were an electric boiler it would be a thicker diameter of cable. Now we forgot about our appliance switches. Appliance switches sit on the ring main with a branch off called a spur and these switches control the actual plug socket at the end of the spur powering the appliance. Because these are sitting in an inaccessible position below the kitchen cabinets, we need to control them remotely from these switches. I'll use this symbol on my drawing for my appliance switches. We need to be able to remotely switch off the appliances before we start to, for example, work on them, maintain them or do repairs. For these appliance switches, these will also sit above the worktop and will be the same height as the sockets we place there and from these switches we'll run a cable off the switch in the same diameter as the ring which allows the switches to turn off the power to the sockets feeding the appliances. For our two thicker 10mm radials supplying the oven and the induction hob, it's the same principle except unlike say a dishwasher or fridge freezer, usually these appliances don't have plugs and are hardwired into terminal sockets in turn controlled by the switch above the worktop. I explain it better in my induction hall video which you can click on here. Sometimes I'll sketch out wall elevations to help me with this especially if the plan starts looking a little bit crowded like here. Onto our lights Domestic lighting is also done using radials and for a typical three bed house I'll use one millimetre cable. Usually these houses will have a single circuit for the lighting for each storey, serving a variety of switched zones using a combination of switches and junction boxes. Sometimes there's another circuit for the hall lighting, it really just depends on the individual electrician. If you had a lot of high wattage lights you'd maybe split the circuits further, you'd engineer it by counting the fittings and their output and then look at the length and thickness of the cable. Thicker cable can take a greater power load and go for longer and as I said earlier if you're in doubt ask. Instead of 1mm twin and earth you could just play it safe and use 1.5mm for your lighting. Alternatively if you're a bit of a nerd like I am the sums you need to do are real easy and you should have no problem. But since this is a typical two-storey house and I'm building a standard single-storey kitchen extension with a standard amount of lighting, I'm not doing the sums and neither will your electrician whom you are paying. To avoid any problems with the existing lighting in the house, I'll just make a single new radial circuit for my extension lighting. 
and break it up into individual runs for each area using a combination of switches and junction boxes to create my separate lighting areas. I'll think about where I might like to be standing when I switch my lights and how I want to use the space in order to figure out the number of zones and the position of the switches. Here I'm thinking about a set of direction wall lights to bounce light off the sloping ceiling and back down onto the dining area. So I'll make a switch to control these and then I want some down lighting via some recessed spotlights to provide task lighting over the island unit and the countertops so that will be my second switched area. Because I want both light groups to be switched from both sides of the room, I'll use what we call a three core cable, still one millimeter diameter, for the intermediate switching to create two way switches. I've got some outside lights, so we'll create a zone and include a switch for that. And we are done. Please give me a thumbs up to help my channel. And in the next video, I'll explain how I use these electrical layouts, buy the materials and start on the wiring itself.